So we just talked about the cardiac function curve. Let's talk about the venous return curve. So we're talking more, or at least focusing more, on the blood coming back to the heart as opposed to focusing on the cardiac output. So in this situation, we want to kind of change the cardiac output to see what happens to the right atrial pressure. So again, I'm gonna leave my axes the same, which actually makes this kind of nice. This is why I can overlay these two curves. So the x-axis, again, is right atrial pressure, and the y-axis, again, is cardiac output. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm looking more so, though, in this curve, I'm measuring more of what's happening to my venous return. So you can see I flipped the independent and the dependent variable. I'm measuring more so the right atrial pressure and changing the cardiac output. So here I'm gonna put a cardiac output of five, and let's say we have a right atrial pressure. Let's move the zero to over here. So now I'm gonna generate a curve something like this, okay? So this is kind of what your standard curve will look like. Now what this is saying is, is that at right atrial pressures of zero, again, cardiac output's five. Nothing's really changed from what we saw in that aspect from the last curve, okay? So again, that's kind of our baseline target point here. But as the cardiac output comes down, as I change the cardiac output and it comes down, the right atrial pressure is going up, okay? So as the cardiac output comes down, the right atrial pressure is going up. Why is that? Well, as I move down this curve, I'm decreasing the cardiac output more and more. And so I have more blood backed up, so to speak, in the right atrium, increasing the right atrial pressure. Again, we're changing the cardiac output to see what happens to our venous return or our right atrial pressure, which is the surrogate marker of that. Sometimes also said to be the surrogate marker of the central venous pressure, the CVP. Okay, so that's the concept. So that's why in a cardiac function curve, you're looking at cardiac function. You wanna see what happens to the cardiac output when I change right atrial pressure. Here, we're looking at as I change the cardiac output, what happens to the right atrial pressure. Now, a very important point to remember is this point down here. So I'm gonna do it in a different color actually. So this point right here, okay, so I'm just gonna put PM here for mean systemic filling pressure. The idea here is, is as the cardiac output goes to zero, which is eventually when it reaches the X axis here, the cardiac output is gonna be zero. Okay, so when the cardiac output is zero, the heart isn't pumping any blood forward. There's no volume of blood going forward. And so all that blood is gonna get backed up and eventually the circulatory system will kind of equalize in terms of its pressure on the venous side. And so this mean pressure is gonna be represented by this point wherever the uh, curve intersects the x-axis. So we'll call that the x-intercept. So the x-intercept is basically going to be when the cardiac output is zero, right? When the cardiac output is zero, we hit the x-intercept, and that is gonna tell us the mean systemic filling pressure. I'm just gonna put a P for pressure. The mean systemic filling pressure, we'll call it PM. Now, if the heart is restarted, right? If the heart's restarted and my cardiac output goes back up, then my right atrial pressure is going to come down. Okay, so that's the concept. Now, the other question you might have is, okay, we get, we get that, but why at the top here, once we get to about you know zero right atrial pressure, why does the cardiac output just stay at about five? Why doesn't it keep going up? The reason it plateaus here is because once you get to these negative pressures, what happens is the vena cava will start to collapse and it's not bringing more blood forward because as it collapses, there's no blood getting through the vena cava back into uh, the heart, okay? So the cardiac output cannot exceed you know, a certain number. In this case, you know, in this patient, for example, on this venous return curve, that number might be five. Okay, so that's kind of the general concept of what these venous return curves are. Now, again, you can change the conditions uh, of the curve. So for example, let's just say that I uh, bolus this patient with IV fluids. Okay, so if I just gave this patient a ton of IV fluids, what's gonna happen? Then? Well, now the cardiac output is probably gonna be a little bit higher. Okay, because I gave that patient IV fluids, I've increased the preload and the total blood volume. So the curve is not necessarily going to change in shape, but it will shift upward, okay? It will shift upward. And the reason for that, now at a given cardiac output, my right atrial pressure is gonna be higher. That makes sense. I have more total blood volume overall, okay? And also look at this, the point that this curve crosses the x-intercept, the mean filling pressure is actually gonna be greater. That's because if I stop the heart completely in this patient that I just gave you know, all of these IV fluids to, this patient is gonna have more total blood volume. So when I stop the heart, the veins are accommodating all of that additional blood volume, and that will increase the mean systemic uh, filling pressure. And so we can see that increases in total blood volume will shift the curve upward. 
The other thing is, if I change the venous compliance, let's say that I had venous constriction, okay? So if I had venous constriction, what happens to the venous compliance? Well, the compliance is essentially, kind of in layman's terms, the ability of these veins to accommodate storage of blood, right? And if the compliance is low, I have venoconstriction, right? I'm not able to accommodate the blood, I'm shunting that blood up back to the heart. If the venous compliance is uh, high, I'm better able to accommodate the blood, and that's more of like venodilation, which we would classically see with nitrates. But if my sympathetic nervous system is activated, for example, I would have more venoconstriction, and that would have a lower venous compliance. So if the venous compliance is low, in other words, venoconstriction, I'm shunting more blood back to the heart, that's gonna increase my cardiac output, right? That's gonna shift my curve upward. In other words, for a given cardiac output, I have a higher right atrial pressure, and I would have a higher mean systemic filling pressure because of the venoconstriction, right? It'd be a higher pressure. Okay, so that's the general concept. So having a decreased venous compliance, or we can put venoconstriction, or increasing total blood volume is gonna shift the curve up. And a lot of this stuff, you know, you might be thinking, wow, this is really hard. How do I remember all this stuff? You just have to kind of, Take your time and look at things intuitively. If I'm increasing blood volume, I'm increasing preload. I'm increasing stroke volume. I'm increasing cardiac output. I expect a higher cardiac output. I know I'm gonna be shifting this curve most likely up. And for venous compliance, right, if I'm shunting more blood back to the heart, I'm should ha I should expect to have a higher cardiac output. I should expect to have a higher right atrial pressure. Okay, so the opposite is also true, right? So if I had venous dilation, what would happen to the curve, right? If I had increase in venous compliance, or if we're talking about venodilation, right, venodilation, what would happen? Then I'd have a curve that essentially is going to get shifted downward. If I have a decrease in total blood volume, it's the same concept, right, lower cardiac output, uh, lower right atrial pressure. So that's the general concept. So overall, you can see the maximum cardiac output is also gonna be lower if I have a lower total blood volume as opposed to if I had a higher total blood volume. And the mean systemic filling pressure is also gonna be lower in the setting of lower uh, blood volume or venodilation. Now, the only other major thing about this curve is the slope of the curve. So you'll notice that all of these slopes are gonna be, you know, my, my lines aren't completely straight here, but they're all essentially supposed to be the same. There's not a huge difference in the slope. But what can change the slope of this curve is the total peripheral resistance, okay, or the afterload. And so, for example, let's say that I had arterial vaso dilation. Okay, so if I had arterial vasodilation, so think of a drug that would do this. We already said hydralazine is going to be the big one, right? So if I use hydralazine and I have arterial vasodilation, what's going to happen to my TPR? My TPR is going to go down, right? Which means my afterload is also going to go down. So my TPR and my afterload are going to go down with arterial vasodilation from a drug like hydralazine. And when that happens, what's going to happen to this curve is the slope is actually going to go up. Okay, so the slope is actually going to go up, which is a little confusing, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Remember, my cardiac output, we're talking about left ventricle here, is pushing against the aorta and the arterial system and the arterioles, right? That's what we're thinking about when we think about afterload. That's what we talked about in the last video. If I have less resistance that I'm, that I'm pushing my blood against, I'm going to be able to get more blood ejected from the heart. And so that's why the slope here is increasing. The cardiac output is disproportionately increasing in relationship to the right atrial pressure. That's why the slope is increasing. Okay, my, now if I shut down the heart completely, it doesn't necessarily matter what my changes were at the arterioles. The mean systemic filling pressure is gonna be the same. I didn't add volume. I didn't change the, you know, the storage container as I call the venous circulation. I didn't change how big or small my storage container was in the venous side. I'm not changing how much blood is getting shunted to the heart. I'm just shutting down the resistance, but the resistance doesn't matter if I'm not pumping any blood against it. That, so that's not going to change. And so the mean systemic filling pressure is actually gonna be the same. The only thing that's changing is the slope. Remember, what's slope? Slope is rise over run, right? Y over X. So my cardiac output, it's, this is increasing because the cardiac output is disproportionately raised in relationship to the right atrial pressure when I lower afterload. Okay, so that's kind of the concept of that. Now, conversely, if I increase the afterload, okay, if I have a aortic coarctation or I give a patient phenylephrine, for example, then I'm going to lower the slope. We're changing the slope, but we're not changing the mean systemic filling pressure. That's the same. Okay, that's the important part. So you can see the slope of the curve defined by total peripheral resistance.